All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of hot nonsense from Patreon. Lots of gems, lots of Latimus Dorsey, and lots of, hey, bro, take it easy. We're just training here. i got to get my reps in. And by the way, you're doing it all wrong. Let's get to it. And every day, I practice martial arts. What's <laughs> up? Yo, Mikey, how you doing, man? I'm doing great, Seagong. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, here we are, probably, uh, for those of us, uh, or for our listeners who are watching us, uh, probably notice that we have a slightly different change of background today. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that is because we are at the KFG lair. We're at my, my new apartment, which is still being put together. Um, not because uh, we can't record at the school, but just we're kind of hanging out today, and we had the idea to maybe come over here and do some research for an upcoming interview we're going to be doing. And hey, oh, yeah. while we're at it, why don't we just go ahead and record an episode of KFG at my place with our swanky new cameras. Swanky new uh, cameras, no, um, you know, like, what's it, like police cars coming to pick Dre up. That's right. Because, you, know I mean? um, you know, for, for people who may or may not know, we usually record the podcast at uh, City Wing Chun at my school. Uh, behind, we have a special curtain we pull out when we do the uh, when we do the episodes, but because it is in Midtown, uh, hearing sirens and all sorts of nonsense is a pretty normal thing. But I live out here in Queens, which is part of New York City, for those of you who don't know. And I live in a decidedly more chill neighborhood. So uh, there should hopefully be less sirens and stuff uh, on this episode. Um, very happy to do this. Uh, and it's always great hanging out with you. Uh, we don't have Dre today, not because of uh, typical diva like behavior, but. Uh, Dre has contracted the virus of unknown origins. Yeah, it's very unfortunate. Yes, um, which is uh, too bad because, uh, as we've talked about on previous episodes, uh, we are going to do something special for our season three finale. Our season three finale is coming up. It's not the next episode. It is the episode after. And uh, as it was suggested to us by AJ, the podcaster, we should do a Jeopardy-style quiz show for the final episode of the third season. Yes. So I already put it together. I was ready to record it. And then Dre, unfortunately, contracted the virus of unknown origins. And uh, we're going to have to wait a little bit to do that. We'll obviously still do it as the season finale. I mean, on our end, we just have to wait before we can record it. I'm very excited because I did a three. It's like a three round kind of quiz showdown. Mm -hmm. Round one is going to be uh, Jeopardy style questions where I say the answer and you have to basically, your answer is the question that it would be. And we have three categories for that. It's going to be the first three seasons of KFG. Uh, And then just like in in, um, Jeopardy, there are five questions in each category. Normally, I think there's six categories in a Jeopardy round. We only have three, which is season one, two, and three, but we have the five questions. That's just going to be round one. Round two, we're going to have uh, multiple choice questions, which I'm not sure if I want to do it in the style of um, who wants to be a millionaire, Um, because if we do it that way, then I'm going to have to come up with an extra set of questions for you and for Dre, Uh, or if I'm just going to have you guys try to duke it out on that. And then there's a final shootout round, which is five questions that need to be answered like in a lightning round very fast. There are five questions for you to answer about Dre, and then he'll have five <laughs> questions to answer about you, and that'll determine the final winner. I don't know if that quiz format we came up with is going to take up an entire episode. Uh, if it doesn't, um, you know, if, if we end up doing this, and it's going to be really funny. I'm very excited. I, I really am bummed out because we wanted to record it yesterday or today, and I'm like, oh, now i got to wait because the questions are really good. Mm-hmm. I can't wait to see how well you do compared to how awful Dre will do answering these questions. And, um, he might pull it out of the bag, though, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, you don't like, know, just, you don't know. Like have one of those moments and suddenly he's just like, zing! You yes, know? He's, in, he's, in the, he's in the zone, so to yeah, speak. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's possible. And then if, if we end up, because I don't know how long that takes, we haven't done it before. It could be that it ends up taking... I mean, you know, my concern when, you know, I I create something like this, we do it and it's like it's done in 10 minutes and then it's like, crap, what are we going to fill out for the remaining hour of this podcast? So Mm -hmm. if uh, we can't finish uh, or or the quiz show ends too quickly, 
then uh, we have a really nice season three recap uh, to talk about afterwards. So I'm very excited about the finale. We don't have breaks between seasons. So when we tell people it's season three, it's just it's somewhat arbitrary. A season in the world of the KFG podcast is just a year. It's mm-hmm. 52 episodes because we have an episode every week. Yeah, We're going to pick up the following week with season four. So there's no break or anything like that. So it doesn't really mean anything in terms of our day to day. Although we do have new equipment now, which we're testing out the cameras. Mm-hmm. And we also... We also have new mics coming too, They're right? coming, yeah. I'm just trying to work out. Bloody FedEx screwed us over Black Friday, and so I'm having a nightmare getting a lot of this stuff fixed up because you yeah, do this whole thing where, like, well, FedEx are the ones that completely screwed it, but then it's like, well, you know, we... It's sitting at Becca's return now, so we can't really give you the... De- Luckily, I have all the emails. Right. So right, I right. have an email telling that they'll just turn it to a pickup. And I'm like, okay, because that's what it is. Because that's yeah. my fear is that they'll be like, yeah, we can't give you the discount. And I'll be like, right. F you, basically. Because the KFG podcast needs to buy its equipment on heavy discount. <laughs> Big time. But it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. it. We're going to have better audio. Obviously, we have slightly better video now. Mm-hmm. Or much better video, I should say. So we'll be able to do a lot more. Uh, In season four, I'm looking forward to doing more interviews because there's some interviews that people really liked. Bay Logan interview did really well. Mm -hmm. Um, And we have a bunch of interviews ready to go. John Little's interviews always kill. The Steve Carriage interviews always kill. So I'm very excited to do more interviews in season four. I'm actually really excited to do more lives. Yes, yes. That's the other thing, too. We we didn't do too many lives this year. No. Um, But lives uh, lives are a lot of fun and and because they're a little more chaotic. Uh, well, so I'm looking th- th- this time the chaos is going to be different. You yeah, know what the I mean? chaos those, should just be from what we're talking about, yes. not from like shit not working. Yes, absolutely. Right? <laughs> that's the plan. You know what I mean? So, yeah. hey, you know, if we get big, then I might be like kind of I'll send out what's the word, um, 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 you know, an application form for people to come in and take over my job while we do lives. Yes. You know perfect. I mean? Perfect. It'd be super uh, cool. So before we get started, just want to remind everyone that the best way to support the Kung Fu Genius is on Patreon. Patreon.com slash the Kung Fu Genius. For as little as $5 a month, you can get access to episodes early. You also get my Instagram subscriber reels. And for higher levels of support, there are all sorts of other things, including at the baller level, you get a private episode with me. Mm-hmm. And it's the best way to support the Kung Fu Genius podcast because we get shit views on YouTube. So the YouTube people are like, oh, yeah, you're making all this money on YouTube. Uh, no. <laughs> like, like, no one makes no. money on YouTube unless you're like one of the, like, like Jake Paul or any of those yes. other people that actually have millions upon millions of subscribers. Right, right, right. You know yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean we'll, we'll get through those. Change. Yeah, it's really chump change. Um, but the Patreon, uh, the Patreons are really our, our top supporters. Mm-hmm. And we do these Ask Me Anything episodes now exclusively just f- from our Patreon. So yes. we, we used to do it from the YouTube comments. Now, if you want to ask a question for the Kung Fu Genius to answer, uh, you got to be on our Patreon. So, and that's exactly what we're doing today. This is this is maybe the last AMA for this season. Yep. So we will we have a couple of Patreon questions uh, um, lined up, and then for our next episode, which is the penultimate episode before the finale, we'll figure out something. But I can't wait until that quiz show episode, man. That's going to be so much fun. Uh, that was really really great idea. Um, curious how many of the audience members will be able to get those questions right too. When we do the live chat, when that episode airs. Mm-hmm. We should have everyone who's in the live chat try to answer those questions while they're they're being asked. That would yeah, be very yeah. interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, the only thing I haven't figured out yet is we're obviously not a game show, so we don't have a buzzer. So when I ask both of you a question, how are we really going to determine who chimed in first? Do we have that? Do we have that that bullshit or that was easy? button that we used to have downstairs still and i have like one of those we do hotel we do. bells yes well, i'm also thinking of just sorry getting something like a bruce lee figurine putting it on the table and then very much in the the cane kung fu way the first person to snatch it mm-hmm. which is a very kung fu thing then they get to answer the question yeah, yeah, yeah. which is funny because i can imagine there'll be a couple close calls and you two will be fighting over it <laughs> give so, me that so we'll see how that goes that should be a lot of fun mm-hmm. um, the, any other question is what should i wear Mm. What do people normally wear in game shows? I suppose it depends on the game show, right? I mean, often I mean they they often time wear suits and ties. You know what I mean? I might mm. come and do it. Maybe I get a nice kind of like you know curly wig. Yes. That'd what kind cool. of game shows did you have in the UK? Well, the same, like when you were growing up. Same a lot of the same game shows that we have over here, but with English hosts. Like, uh-huh. the did pro- you, is there is there an English version of Family Feud? Uh, yeah, it's called um, it's called uh, Family Fortunes. It's exactly the same. Exactly the same. same exactly the same. Uh-huh, uh-huh. We've had many different. But you guys didn't have that. Richard Dawson. You had Dick Dawson. <laughs> oh my god, I would have loved to have <laughs> Dick Dawson. No, we had Les Dennis. 
Uh-huh. <laughs> and Les Dennis, um, who was the other guys? Like we get blankly blank with um, God, I can't remember the famous guy who did that for the longest time. Long since dead. What about Wheel of Fortune? That. Yeah, definitely had Wheel of Fortune. Um, you know, we had also other great, like we had pr- the prices right. Uh huh. What yeah. about Press Your Luck? Do you remember Press Your Luck? I don't think I remember Press Your Luck. Press Your Luck was an amazing game show in the eighties. And it was almost like kind of a, not a roulette wheel, but it was almost like a, like a Vegas gambling style game where there would be all these lights, right? And it would go, doo, 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 and you had to hit the, you had to hit the buzzer and then it would stop and it would either stop on like $400 or $500 or, or a bonus or a trip or whatever. Um, and then that would be the prize or the amount of money you would get if you got whatever question right. But there were also these whammies, which were like these annoying cartoon characters. And if you landed on one of that, you lost everything. Uh. So so the thing was, you know, it was called Press Your Luck. And it would go, doo, 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 and it was, you know, big bucks, no whammies, big bucks, no whammies, and stop, boom. And then $400, all right, for $400, you know, name, you know, the, the prince of whatever, right? Um, and then uh, what happened was someone figured out, because it was the 80s, those things weren't very sophisticated. Someone figured out the pattern. Oh, wow. And then figured like once this one lit up, you had like three seconds to hit it and you would always land on like the thousand bucks. And there was someone who came and then just kept doing it because he had cracked the code. Right. I think nowadays that wouldn't be a problem because I think it would be much easier to randomize it. Yeah. Um, But yeah, at, at some point someone had like figured it out. It was kind of like the whole. Who wants to be a millionaire scandal where there was someone coughing in the oh, audience? Yeah, yeah. And it's like, like that. a classic, you know yeah. what I mean? We love that back in England. You know, the other thing is, is that we also have like the, the, the prizes are just so much smaller, right? Right. Because so, when we had like, when who wants to, I uh, wasn't uh, who uh, would be a millionaire. What's that one with all the boxes? Why can't I remember the name of it? Same dog millionaire? No, 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 no. <laughs> you funny. <laughs> Age related decline. Was it, oh, deal or no deal? That's it. Deal right? or no deal. So, right. deal or no deal started in England with like uh, 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 Noel Edmonds, who is someone from way back, you know, no tidy beard. He's kind of a beard like mine, kind of slightly odd person as it were. But, you know, it was his comeback and everyone, oh, kind of cool now now you know in in england the the top prize was two hundred and fifty thousand pounds mm-hmm. and everyone that was behind like all the boxes were like the family members of whoever was playing right it was all very english i come to watch it over here big lights everywhere saucy women in like skimpy dresses the money's all the way up to saucy here. women you know what i mean it's uh-huh. like this big huge like crang you come i'm just like oh man the difference between the two like just this huge bombastic kind of like oh and then back home it's a much much quieter affair you yes know what yes, I mean? yes 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 you know and then yeah, you a, can't beat the U.S. on that shit. I you mean, really we, you know, we we yeah. really we really killed that market in game shows. Right? <laughs> we, we really cornered it. Yeah, I mean, listen, we could, I could, we before I get into because I could talk about game shows for ages. England had some classic English game shows that would, did not make it over here. Catchphrase was one, mm-hmm. which was like kind of like you would see this have this big screen that would have like uh, um, you know every like squares would like would like kind of open up and it would show like a, a, an animation and then you had to catch, guess what the catchphrase from that. But my personal favorite was Bullseye, which was a 70s game show based around the game of darts. Oh, okay. And you have to watch it. To, I cannot do it justice when I say that the great Jim Bowen, who was like this ex-school teacher from up north, who like the glasses and all this, like he just spoke like this. But like, you know, is it you don't get now for two in a bed, not in this game and all this kind of stuff. And the prizes were terrible. So wait, what is it called again? It's called Bullseye. Bullseye. It's called so Bullseye. So to go to YouTube, type in yeah. Bullseye. Talk, type in Bullseye, like game show. Game and show just Bullseye. Like, all right, I'll just, check it out. You will, you will love it. Just because awesome. it's like se- like 70s people, like fat guys with moustaches and stashes. just like yeah, yeah just oh it's amazing you know and then <laughs> the prize bits like you have the book the the uh the 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 the, the darts caller it's like in one you know you're gonna look fantastic in this lovely pair of clogs in two and stuff like that wow <laughs> wow have to watch it have incredible to watch it. incredible yes. incredible indeed all right all so, right so let's get to it let's get we to have it. some patreon questions so what if you could transport back in time for a front row seat into the life and legacy of one of the most respected wing chun masters in history gong sao wong a tribute direct students on sifu wong so Leung offers you just that through a series of exclusive conversations 25 direct students share anecdotes reflections and personal stories offering in-depth understanding of the man Behind the Legend. Order your copy today across 12 Amazon marketplaces with free shipping. I absolutely love this book, and I think you'll find it an indispensable part of your collection. I can't recommend
recommend it enough. Get yours today. Go to Amazon, type in Gong Sao Wong, and there you go. We do indeed. All right, so let's get to it. Like first Patreon question. Uh, long time uh, support. Roberto Santiago. Awesome. Sifu Alex. I recently started training Wing Chun under your friend Sifu M- Milos Draculic at his brand new My VLMA Kun in Plantation, Florida. One of the best things I've learned is how to increase the power of my Wing Chun straight punches by tightening my Latimus dorsi muscles. You know, yeah. <laughs> that's fun. It's funny when you go full Latin on that. Like, yes. I love to tighten my and then put in any latin two word like two term phrase it's gonna sound funny fantastic yeah latin, latin was never my strong point vaginus majoris <laughs> yeah that's i suffer from that often um my question to you is what are your favorite methods techniques or exercises to develop piercing punching power in your wing chun straight and chain punches thanks awesome that's a great question yes it is. yeah so he mentions my friend milos draculich who's actually a wing chun instructor who taught in berlin for the longest time oh wow and uh, yeah, it seems he's m- migrated over to Florida of all places, and now he's teaching <laughs> Wing Chun down there, which is great because um, WT, the specific brand of you know Wing Chun that I teach, has been relatively poorly represented in the U.S. and North America compared to Europe, where it really took off. Um, so it's kind of cool to see other people come here who kind of know what they're doing in the WT world and 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 get you know kind of supported as well, right? Um, yeah, so so basically. When we punch in Wing Chun, all right, and of course, um, when you're when you're when you're developing power or you're trying to um, transfer power into your opponent, really, power development is not the correct term because you can develop a lot of power, but the point is, can you transfer that power into your opponent or into a bag? Yeah. yeah. So when we're when we're discussing these kind of things, we really should should think about the term about power transfer, not development, because you could you could really tense your whole body really really tight and be red in the face and you're you're producing a lot of tension but that doesn't that's not transferable power right so we we really want to talk about what can we transfer into our opponent so there's a couple schools of thought of course when you talk to the more esoteric or internal guys they're they're going to discuss things that um you know maybe would not survive peer review in any 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 place in academia you know the alignment of your chakras and cheese and and, mm-hmm. and all this kind of stuff right yeah, and yeah, yeah you think of a certain mantra when you punch or whatever right um and then you're gonna have people who are who look at it in a very mechanistic kind of way the the mechanics of your arm and what muscles you use or whatever and then you have people who kind of mm, find a little middle ground in terms of like okay well you have to use you have to put your arm in this position but you have to get a little bit of a feel for this so the the moment you discuss in Chinese martial arts, I, I, I never have these problems when I talk to my friends who do boxing or, yeah, yeah. or who do other martial arts. But when you get into Chinese martial arts, because everyone is so holier than thou mm-hmm. in terms of their methods and, you know, what's secret and how to really hit and all this kind of stuff. That, you know, the moment you describe things in a mechanistic fashion, like what are the actual mechanics of punching, then you're going to have someone come in and say, oh... It's because you don't understand about alignment and fucking and all this kind of stuff, right? And then the moment you start talking about fucking and alignment, someone's going to say, why can't you just explain it with normal body mechanics, right? Yeah. So I'm very pragmatic. I discover, I like to discuss things with normal ass mechanics, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, that's a registered trademark, by the way, normal ass mechanics. Mm-hmm. Um, you heard it here first, kids. Because the main thing um, that, you know, and, and I'll get to this question in a moment, but it's great because it, 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 it in my, at least in my opinion, I don't know, my audience might disagree with me. It, it actually is a great springboard for a great topic, which is like how we even discuss these things in the weird walled garden of Chinese martial arts, right? right. Um, if you were to go to a, uh, you know, a, a really solid boxing gym, right? And you had a really good boxing trainer. Um, they would have multiple different ways to explain the punch from a mechanical perspective, from a feeling perspective, hitting the mitts, alignment. You know, you, you kind of tackle it from a bunch of different ways, right? Um, Chinese Kung Fu people, I think sometimes want to hear that one thing that yeah. one, that one secret, you know, twist of the wrist in the last moment, which you then tense this thing here and then, you know, align this chakra or whatever. And then, you know, your opponent is going to spit blood and lose blood from every orifice in their body or whatever. And they want to hear something <laughs> like that. Right. Um, instead of like going, okay, like this is how you start. You want to get a feel for the arm, the alignment of the fist, the placement of the shoulder, 
Here's how you can add your footwork in if you're using a step or if you're using a turn. And and then you can kind of build it up. But there's no like one silver bullet explanation where you go like tense your lats. OK, now your punch is going to be fine. Right. Yeah. Or, you know, make sure that you land with the ring finger, not like aim with the ring finger knuckle. OK, it's actually a collection of all of these points. Yeah. And by learning these different things, the the, the, the X factors and you have to put it into practice. Right. And you can have it. You can have a coach or a Sifu or an instructor explain to you the timing of the punch, the timing of the wrist, the timing of the elbow, the shoulder, how to move this, how to do that. But at the end of the day, you have to stand in front of a wall bag. And just do it thousands and thousands and thousands of times. Yeah. Because until you start getting the experience where you can start to feel it yourself, you're basically renting your Kung Fu from your instructor. Right. But you have to, at some point, own it. And the only way you can own it is through your own personal experience where you can listen to what your Sifu says, you can start to integrate it, and then you start to use your own brain which you're allowed to in Chinese Kung Fu. Really? Despite what people tell you. Um, and then start to figure it out. And then it becomes your own. And then you may even find your own way of explaining it or expressing it, even if the mechanics are the same as your Sifu taught you, but you have a slightly different way of expressing it. So I think sometimes people get a little uh, too excited about specific explanations, especially if it's an explanation they never heard before. Right. And then they make a big jump. Yes. Let's say you've been practicing Wing Chun for a few years under a certain Wing Chun Sifu. You don't really feel like you're making any progress. You go to another Wing Chun Sifu. That Wing Chun Sifu says, hey, tighten your lats. Mm -hmm. And then you tighten your lats. You punch. Wow, my punch is so much better. And then now you think that that's everything. Oh, my God, because it made a huge jump. Yeah. And um, it, that could have been the missing link. But when it comes to something like a punch, there's so many variables, so many details. Not to mention we have different types of punches in Wing Chun that um, you, ne you need to contextualize all these things as this is all part of what's going to make me good at this. And, and yeah. don't put too much stock in that one silver bullet explanation, right? <laughs> um, because sometimes people hear an explanation, which gives them a huge jump in, let's say, power of the punch. And then they're like, okay, well, then I guess I'm good. I'll work on something else. No, you need to keep working on that punch. Yeah. You need to take that thing that you just learned, which was a huge springboard, and now add it to what you had learned previously, integrate it into other things that you're doing, and start to improve it on your own using your own brain right um and using your own you know you know trial and error right you can go up to a wall bag um which for people who don't know this is probably not the podcast for you the wall bag is basically a canvas bag filled with rice or sand up against a sturdy wall and this is the punching uh as a punching equipment of choice for wing chun people it's not the only one um the wall bag, and I've discussed this many times on the podcast, I've discussed this also in theory classes online and so on. The wall bag is really, everyone should hit the wall bag a lot in Wing Chun. Right. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't also hit a heavy bag. I believe you should hit a heavy bag. You should hit like a Muay Thai style bag that goes all the way to the ground. A shorter style, more classic boxing heavy bag. Uh, speed bags. Uh, then partner training focus mitts or your partner has a really big kick shield and you punch the kick shield as well. Yeah. So w what you really want to do is you want to you want to accumulate as much experience as you can with this one tool. You want to know what it's like, let's just say in the case of chain punching, to keep it simple for Wing Chun. You want to know what it's like to chain punch stationary in front of a wall bag. You want to know what it's like to chain punch maybe in an advancing stance in front of a wall bag. You want to know what it's like to chain punch while using turning, for example. And then you want to be able to do that on heavy bag, on the other type of bag, on a speed bag, on focus mitts with a partner. And what you do is you, what you start to realize is by training the same punch in different types of on different types of equipment, you learn different things. Yeah. This thing teaches you something about the timing of the wrist. This other piece of equipment teaches you how to align your stance when you punch. The other thing teaches you elbow power. The other thing teaches you um, efficiency and movement because if you don't punch efficiently, you're going to get tired, right? Yeah. So I, I would say um, always don't put all your eggs in one basket. Right. So that's what I would say first off, right? There yeah. are a lot of different methods to de developing the, the punch in Wing Chun. I think the wall bag is the best for the beginner, um, but even for advanced practitioners. I mean, I, I hit heavy bags and I hit mitts, but I still hit the wall bag regularly. Yeah. All right. There's some people that think I've even heard some theories like uh, proper Wing Chun training is you, you, hit, you hit the wall bag intensely for three years and then you don't do it anymore. And the reason why they say that is because if you do too much wall bag, you're going to damage your joints. You're going to bust your hands. You're going to 
whatever like there's always this kind of superstitious bullshit in in chinese kung fu and yeah. wing chun for as pragmatic as it is some of that stuff still creeps in yeah these like weird abstentions but don't do too much of this don't do that and 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 it kind of makes people afraid of doing anything because they're afraid of doing something wrong right and so just go do something go try it and if it doesn't work do something else yeah um listen to experts but also trust your own experience right mm -hmm. and like that that's something that's frowned down upon in the very kind of patriarchal chinese kung fu model um and i i really would advise wing chun practitioners to take what their sifu says to heart practice it but also use your own brain all yeah. right so the wall bag is great because the real resistance of the wall bag is not the wall bag itself it's the wall behind it yes so when when you hit a wall bag at the proper distance uh for example, you, you really try to launch a heavy punch. The wall is going to stop you. Yeah. So you, you get a bit of an isometric effect when you hit against a fixed object where you can no longer uh, contract or extend your muscles anymore because you're now pushing against something that's not moving. So you get that isometric effect, which is great for tendon and ligament strength, which mm -hmm. is a huge X factor in punching skill. Yes. Which is why people who look kind of wiry and sinewy and light might be able to punch way heavier than their body weight because they have very thick and strong tendons. I believe, yes. I believe Bruce Lee was one of those guys. Mm -hmm. Why was he able to hit so much over his own body weight? What you yeah. would expect someone who's 125, 130 pounds to hit. Yeah. I think because he had extraordinarily thick and strong tendons and strong ligaments. Because it wasn't his muscle bulk. Yeah, he was fit. But, I mean, if you would see Bruce Lee in a normal shirt walking down the street... Um, not, you know, like a long sleeve shirt yeah. and he wasn't flat. He would not be the most impressive person you would see walking down the street. Yeah. Yes. When he takes his shirt off, he's striated. And when he does his lat flare, he has all that kind of stuff. But what really allowed him to punch very heavily besides his technique, um, I believe was the tendon strength. And right. the reason why I think that is because of the type of training he did. Yeah. And also the feats of strength he was able to do are the types of feats of strength that are in alignment with extremely sinewy strong tendons as yes. opposed to just like he did stuff bodybuilders can't do for yeah, example right absolutely so um so you have that tendon training in the wall bag if you're really hitting the wall bag in a very heavy way and then when you hit the bag you're still trying it's like you're trying to knock the wall over which you'll never be able to do yeah so i think the wall bag is really really important yeah. for that right other types of equipment are more dynamic the wall bag you know what are the, what are the what's the downside of the wall bag it doesn't move you can't continually step while hitting the wall bag. Yeah. Um, it's kind of at a flat angle. So when you do a punch with a turn, you have to adjust the wrist a little bit. So it's not perfect. It's right. really good for the straight punch. It's really good for kicks. Uh, it's awful for elbows. Do not elbow a wall bag unless you just want to ru <laughs> ruin your shoulder. Um, because I see people throw elbows on the wall. It's like you, you're hitting with full power yeah. against a fixed object and your shoulder is just going to eat all that. You want to hit, you want to use elbow strikes. Do it on focus mitts. Do it on kick shields. Do it on a a, a free swinging Muay Thai bag. Don't do yeah, it. Yeah. Don't do it on a wall bag. Right. Um, likewise, knees don't really make a whole lot of sense there either. So really, the wall bag should be for your punches and kicks, straight kicks. Um, <clears throat> in terms of tensing your muscles, all right. Um, it's 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 not my intention to to say anything contradictory to what you know other people in my lineage, other people that I know personally say. I, I if if putting a focus on your lats when you punch has increased your punching output or your punching strength, yep. then the last thing I want to do is say, no, I think that's wrong. Right. Okay. Um, because the worst thing you can do is take something that helps someone get better mm -hmm. and then say, no, that's actually wrong. Yeah. And now they, they don't trust it. And mm -hmm. then they've lost that thing that made them better. And now they're searching for something else. Yes. If you feel that tensing your lats has made you punch better then by all means, tense the shit out of your lats okay um however um in the and this is interesting this is someone we had very early on in the podcast uh, kenneth J, a very good friend yes. of mine uh who's a doctor of sport physiology if you have not seen that episode um it wasn't a regular interview we we actually did a series of like kind of short episodes where we reviewed like the training in the rocky montage yeah, and yeah. And things like that. And 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 yeah. I, I've had him on during COVID, I think. Yes, that's um, correct. Before the Kung Fu Genius podcast, where I was just doing like some random videos on YouTube, which yes. are on this channel. Mm -hmm. And they predate like season one of, of KFG. But you'll find some weird playlists on this channel. Well, or it was when we were, you were, uh, was it, yeah, it was all like kind of discussing the actual 
merits of the like kind of uh, workout regimes in like the sort of action movies. Like yes, Rocky yes, yes, yes. Know, like but I also did an episode where we just talked about things like tendon strength and stuff right. like that. Right mm -hmm. now, Kenneth, a little bit about his background. Um, he uh, was originally one of like the, the kind of, I guess you could call the, the first guys to really kind of push hard style kettlebelling, which right. was the first phase of kettlebell training, at least in the U S through Pavel Satsuli, which was the idea that when, you know, if you just grab and lift the kettlebell off the ground, you know, you got to get in your stance. You have to basically go into a kind of a full squat position with your butt out. And when you pick that thing up, you're tensing the living piss out of everything. Right? Yeah. You're, you know, you're, you're keeping your shoulders back, lats, this, hips, forward. And it was like, you know, it's, everything's like very, very hard style, right? And um, that was also the style of kettlebelling that I learned first. Yeah. And it certainly has its merits. Um, you know, this kind of, hyper radiation and full body tension for certain types of strength it has its merits but kenneth in a very kind of i, I suppose you could say almost like in a jeet kune do kind of way if you imagine that um hard style kettlebelling if if you make the analogy of hard style kettlebelling like is traditional martial arts right and the reason why i draw that comparison is because the hard style kettlebelling like that came from pavel at least in those days and pavel now uh, it used to be called the RKC, the Russian Kettlebell Challenge. Yeah. And then eventually, I think Pavel broke away from the guy who started that uh, or, or who was running that. And then he started his own, I think it's called Strong First. Right. Which, from what I understand, is still more or less the same style of kettlebelling. But yeah. I don't know. They may have changed the methods. They may have expanded some things. So I, I don't want to speak out of school. I don't know what Strong First is really doing right now. Right. I can only speak about like what the RKC used to be, right? Yes. Because I learned that method first. And Kenneth J was like a master RKC. And then at some point, you know, because he's also a researcher, he's a doctor of sport physiology, he started to look into the research in terms of like, how do we, about human performance and power and uh, power transfer and all these kind of things. And like, you know, what is really the, the best way to lift the weight to become a better athlete? Yeah. And what he started to realize is it wasn't tensing the living shit out of everything. Okay. And the reason is when we talk about like, you know, and I know it's, it's also very prickly, like, look, you think martial arts are prickly discuss, look, look at the body pe people like Greg Doucette and all these guys who talk about fitness and about like all those people fight about everything. It's the internet. It's like, yeah. people don't agree on how to lose weight. People don't agree on how to build muscle. People don't agree on anything. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but you can look at the science and yes. say, well, what does science say? Yeah. Because everything else is just marketing. Um, and when it comes to performance, now, when I talk about performance, I mean, like, picking up a ball and throwing it. I mean, like, holding your hand and punching, yeah. kicking, moving, you know, fighting, clinching, grappling, takedowns, that kind of stuff. I'm not talking about um, uh, hypertrophy for bodybuilding. Yeah. Okay. Because... Uh, weightlifting so some it was funny we had a comment on a youtube channel uh, on one of our youtube videos uh, a couple videos ago where um oh apropos it was about viking samurai right and i was talking about um the problem with what i see with viking samurai's quote unquote training for preparing for boxing is that he's doing bodybuilding training pretty much right after a boxing session yeah and then someone in the comments was like well, Bruce Lee did, you know, weightlifting and so-and-so did weightlifting. And so yeah. <laughs> it's it be, because in, in traditional martial arts, um, even in boxing in the old days, like lifting weights was really frowned upon because, uh, you know, in the old days, they said, oh, if you lift weights, like, even in boxing trainers would tell you not to lift weights because yeah. it's going to make you slow. It's going to make you muscle bound right. and so on and so forth. And in Chinese martial arts, I mean, even just in my own wheelhouse, the Leung Teng Wing Chun, I mean, you can pick almost any one of his books that he wrote and he has a paragraph or two shitting on weightlifting, you know, that, that it's going to um, it's going to make you tense. It's going to make you slow. It's, it's you know, it's, it's not the thing you need to focus on. And I think um, and this is perhaps because of the level of Leung Teng's English um, and also it's a conflation of terms. This guy goes, well, you know, other, you know, Bruce Lee lifted weights and this guy lift weights and, you know, in Vander Holyfield is blah, 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 or whatever. Right. And what I realize is there's a huge conflation between weightlifting. Yeah. Strength training 
and bodybuilding. Yes. And these are three different things. Yeah. You can lift weights just as part of a routine. You, you do some very light weight lifting to, you know, tone your muscles or to stay in alignment. You can use weight lifting to improve your posture. Yeah. You can use weight lifting to improve, you know, to, for rehab, for things that aren't right. You know, you want to, you have a little bit of asymmetry when you walk. So you do certain, you know, you, you can be therapeutic. That can be weightlifting. It can be a part of a regular workout regimen, but not the whole thing. Yeah. Um, then you have strength training, you know, where you're doing, you know, squats and bench and all that. It's kind of like a compound lifts where you're using a lot of your body, not, not isolated stuff. Yeah. Or it's not even about weightlifting. It could even just be throwing a medicine ball against a wall, you know, something where you're using your whole body to develop strength. Right. And then you have bodybuilding, which is the use of weights yeah. to build up uh, muscles, f- mainly for the sake of show. Yes. But I had an interesting conversation with Kenneth many, many years ago about um, what is considered a sport and what's not. And technically, bodybuilding doesn't actually fulfill the criteria for sport. Yeah. Because what you're actually doing is purely subjective aesthetics. Yes. And and there's no like aim to get the ball in here or you have to have a certain size biceps to win. Yeah. The judges just need to look at you compared to all the other people and see who's kind of more symmetrical or who looks better. <laughs> right. Um, so it, it's interesting. I mean, I believe bodybuilding should be considered a sport because of everything that's involved in it. I mean, I, I look at bodybuilding. I say shit on bodybuilding all the time. Uh, because of my biases, because of Wing Chun. But I, I've been able, mainly through Greg Doucette's videos, to appreciate bodybuilding, and also f- through Kenneth Jay, to appreciate bodybuilding. Yeah. But in a way where, like, yeah, yeah, but that's not what you want to do to be good at Wing Chun or punching or whatever. But, yeah. I mean, you can look at, like, a Jay Cutler, or you can look at um, a Chris Bumstead, who's, like, the current big guy there, or Arnold Schwarzenegger back in the day, and go, yeah, I mean, those guys did some serious fucking work. Yeah. And those guys are good. But the problem is that this guy was like, yeah, well, these guys also did bodybuilding, whatever. I'm like, no, you're conflating bodybuilding and strength training and weightlifting. These are different things. So um, back to Kenneth Jay's thing, like the old RKC was all hard style. And when Kenneth started to do the research, he says, you know, if you want to take this kettlebell and put it up over your shoulder. Yep. Um, why do you need to tense the shit out of your butt or your glutes? Right. OK, because you're you're his hype and I'm going to do it. a I'm going to go so fast through it. I'm going to do it a huge disservice. Mm-hmm. But the idea is that your brain is wired for movement. And if right. you're going to pick up something heavy, provided you're not doing it with your back or some egregiously poor way of picking something up, your body pretty much knows what muscles it needs to tense and in what order right. in order to, to grab this thing and put it over there. And when you say, no, I need to tense my shoulder and push this down and pull and tense my lat and pull this back and the head needs to be here and tense my chin and tense my teeth and my tongue needs to be mm, pressed up and whatever. It's like you're telling your brain, you're using your frontal lobe, the, yep. the, your, your thinking part mm-hmm. to override the movement part yes. and the movement part. It's got it. Yes. If you need if, if, if and, and Kenneth brought this great example, he says, if if you had a pencil on the floor and you were jogging at like a medium clip. And you had to jog across uh, like a gymnasium floor and scoop up a pencil and continue jogging. He goes, if you were to actually see the processes that are involved in your brain to do that, the speed you're going at, you see the pencil, you have to anticipate based on your current speed, when is the right time to start crouching down? You don't want to do it too early or too late. Mm -hmm. How low do you need to go to catch that pencil? Then you have to coordinate catching it in your hands, picking it up, and then continuing to move up. Yeah. The amount of processes that are going on to do that in split second timing without, you're not using your front part of your brain to do that. You're just yeah. doing it. Yep. He goes, that's the problem of robotics with uh, trying to create human like robots. It's not that they're. There, there are machines and, and robots that can do things better than any human. Yeah. But there's no robot. That that a humanoid robot that can yet move like a human. Yes. Even these ones that are getting better and can do things humans can't like jump up, but they can't run and go scoop like this and do do all these things and make all these on the fly decisions. And you can see when you see those robots moving how janky they are. Mm -hmm. Um, The human brain is incredibly wired for movement. Yeah. And so the idea of having to tense things is like it's like. The front part of your brain telling the part of your brain that knows how to move. No, no, no. I got this. Let me tell you how to do it. <laughs> and so there's a lot of extra heat and wastage going on, tensing parts of the body to do something. Yeah. Whereas instead you should think of an external cue rather than an internal cue. 
what is it that you're trying to do? I'm trying to take my fist and I'm trying to punch it through this thing here and start to do that and develop the skill in a much more organic way. Right. So, um, but like I said, I don't want to take away tensing the shit out of his lats if it's helping him punch better. Mm -hmm. um, far be it from me to, to take away people, to take away things that are actually helping people, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, and it's also possible that when Milos saw him, sh uh, sh saw him punching, he saw that there was a, lat, a, a lack of the use of the lat, and the lats are huge in Wing Chun. Yes. That's why you look at any big puncher in Wing Chun, but also in other styles, they all have the, the, the V taper lats. Bruce Lee, <laughs> look at any boxer, look at anyone who's a big puncher, they have the V taper lats. All right. It's, it, it's the muscles on the back, the posterior chain are for go. Yeah. The muscles on the front are for show. Right. All right. <laughs> so anyway. I like that. Fantastic. All right. What else you got? Next question. Mm -mm -mm. Let me get back into position for this next question from, I believe, Oscar Menendez. Oscar Menendez. Mm hmm. How about a battle of the Yip Mans? Maybe use all the actors who have portrayed Master Yip Man and who would win in a battle. Which version of Yip Man had the best fight scenes? Get better soon. Shout out to Mikey and Dre. Take care, Oscar. <laughs> I was actually looking over here because I have a couple of VHSs strewn in here with my books um, because I one actor who was like a childhood actor from China, he actually played Yip Man in a, in a more recent attempt. Um, yeah, that's right. We did, we did this episode in one of my favorite episodes and it was an episode yeah. to the both of us where we did the Bruce Lee Bruce, versus yes. Bruce Lee one. Right. That's a great one. I wish there was somehow I could just keep, we just keep having that discussion. Right. <laughs> Wong um, Fei Hung versus Wong Fei Hung. Yeah. The battle of the Wong Fei Hungs. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, where we, uh, discussed if you took, uh, Bruce Lee's five characters from his different films, mm -hmm. Fist of, uh, or sorry, Big Boss, Fist of Fury, Way of the Dragon, Enter the Dragon and Game of Death and you were to pit them against each other, you know, which one would come out on top. And then, we, you know, we did it very systematically where we would go like, okay, um, we took the big boss version of Bruce Lee and then mm -hmm. we pit him up against the other ones and then, you know, we fist of fury, so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> and it was a very interesting discussion. So this question comes from, okay, well, what if we took the, the various Yip Men films, all right? Yep. Um, well, I think there's really no comparison. I think in terms of, of being a fighter, I think Donnie Yen is the best out of all of them. I yeah. Mean, as much as like we occasionally um, give Donnie shit on this show. Um, oddly enough, I'm drinking tea out of a mug, <laughs> Donnie. Not uh, the mug, because that the mug never existed. <laughs> but a mug. Yeah, but remember, it's not the mug that we were salty about. He was supposed to give me a shout out on uh, about City oh, Wing Chun. Well, yeah, right? there's that too. The, 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 the mug thing was the consolation prize in which I just got the box that the mug would have come in, well, but that, it's signed but, by Donnie. But yet. that's my point. We already know that he should be giving us a shout, a shout out. The fact that we didn't even get the mug in the box. It's like the final kick in the teeth. You right. know what I mean? Oh, right, it's right, just right. like, you know, like. Because I had yeah. to meet Harvey freaking Weinstein mm -hmm. and sit there. For Donnie, for yeah, three or four hours or five hours, however long it was, so long we were there, uh, just for that whole thing with Lang Lang, only for him to not push through or pull through on what he was supposed to do is kind of annoying. Boo. So I so I give Donnie in a lot of shit, and I give Donnie in a lot of shit because despite that he's perhaps the most well paid of all the Yip Men, I don't know maybe Tony Leung got more money for the Grandmaster, but Donnie's done it more times. So I think I still think Donnie gets more money. Has gotten more money to play Yip Man than, than Tony Leung has, even though Tony Leung is a better actor and a bigger star in some respects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, Donnie is the best martial artist, I think, to, to play Yip Man and, mm -hmm. and has the most hard-hitting version of Yip Man on, on film. Yeah. Even though despite all the money he makes, he still didn't bother to shave his damn head for the role or speak Cantonese or close his damn fingers in the Zhong Sao or anything like that, right? Uh, although the first Yip Man movie, I think, was the best uh, in terms of the choreography. And yeah, the, the, I mean, the story's not accurate at all. Second one, everyone loves the second one. I fucking hate the second one. Um, it's, it's just <laughs> such a bad Rocky copy. And, and everyone is just like, everyone's such a caricature of what they're supposed to be. And I get it. These are not documentaries. These, these, are, these are films. I get it. Yeah. All right. But, you know, just to, to echo, uh, you know, what my late friend Chen Chi Man said, it was like, it you have to imagine what it was like for him to watch those movies. Cause that the real Yip Man was his Sifu. Yeah. And, and here's this guy, Donnie Yen portraying his Sifu in a way that's like, it's like not anything like what Yip Man was like. Yeah. 
and and remember like talking to to Chan Sifu about that and he was like yeah I mean the movies are entertaining and everything he goes but but that's not my Sifu that's not how what that's not what Sifu was like or anything like that right yeah um but I think that you know to be fair to Don Yen um even though he didn't speak Cantonese with a Fatsan accent as to Anthony Wong did um I think he's the best fighter out of all of them mm -hmm. um Anthony Wong's portrayal in Yip Man the last uh the final fight is my favorite of all of those yeah. And also the producer, Sing Guat Lam, who produced the Yip Man movies and also Yip Man, The Final Fight. When I met him, he asked me what my favorite of all the Yip Man movies was. And I said, oh, Yip Man, The Final Fight. He said, oh, that was my favorite, too, because it's the most uh, accurate to all of them, right? Yeah. So even the guy who produced, I think, the first Yip Man movie with Donnie Yen and the Anthony Wong one, even he's like, the Yip Man, The Final Fight is the more accurate. It's the one that actually attempts to tell Yip Man's story in Hong Kong, even with some of the warts uh, on there as well. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> But I don't think a Anthony Wong is not the better martial artist. Uh, yes, of course. So I, I think that's an easy one. I think Donnie Yen would slay all these other guys. Now, there's a slew of Yip Man movies that are coming from mainland China, um, which are these are not Hong Kong productions. And it's a mainland actor. You know, sometimes it's the young Yip Man, it's the old Yip Man, um, Yip Man in space, Yip Man this. And these are mainland Chinese, Mandarin speaking mainland Chinese actors. That I like Yip Man met the zombies. That'd be great. Yeah. They might as well just go full crazy with the franchise now. I mean, Yip Man in space. Yeah. Um, yeah, it'd be great. Yip Man in history, right? Big record. There, there, there was a, um, I think it's called Kung Fu League. I may have discussed this before. Um, yes, it's the one that's supposed to be the Avengers style. It's like an thing. Avengers type thing, right? Look, I tell you what, that idea on paper is awesome. Mm -hmm. You take these real kung fu masters from different epochs or maybe some somewhat similar epochs right uh you have uh i think wong fei hong who's a real person fok yun gap the founder of the jingwu academy who may or may not have been a real person <laughs> um <clears throat> then you have uh i think then they had yip man and then I think they even had Tan Zun, who's like the somewhat fictitious character played by Bruce Lee. Yep. The student of Falk Yun Gap. And maybe there was one other one. I don't remember. But the idea was that these were like these real Kung Fu masters. And then they have to assemble, I don't know, to defeat some big Kung Fu boss. And then maybe there's some time travel or some shit involved. Yeah. Because they didn't all live exactly at the same time. But I've heard that it's, it's like a totally unwatchable piece of shit. Um, which is unfortunate because I think the premise that has something there. Right. Yeah. But no, I think Donnie Yen kills all those guys any day of the week. I think he said, you know, if you're going to do, do the, instead of like Yip Man versus Yip Man, you pick a good, good, like kind of classic, you know, Hong Kong actor of, of, of whatever era, right? You know what I mean? And then actually, instead of being, so instead of being Yip Man versus Yip Man, how about Donnie Yen versus Donnie Yen? Oh, like, yeah. Which, which one of his cat, like, because the thing is, like, I'd always say, like, the Kung Fu Jungle, Kung Fu Killer, Donnie Yen is probably would be near the top. He's but, a total modern badass. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. like also Flashpoint Donnie Yen is really, really awesome. Yeah. 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 I, I wonder how, how well versed our audience is on those movies. Cause we could also do like a Donnie Yen versus Donnie Yen one. Right. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. we'd, we'd pick like a select number of his movies. Right. The problem is that um, like, for example, with the Bruce Lee films, it was a little easier to do because even though, because Bruce Lee's five films, there's really four films because game of death wasn't really finished. Yeah, but most of Bruce Lee's movies were. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, it sounds kind of funny. Were somewhat based in reality. Yeah, um, meaning that um, it could still be from this earth. So he like, he didn't have any. There was no like flying. Uh, well, there's a little flying in Big Boss, but there's no like there's no supernatural elements or anything yeah. like that. There's nothing like crazily fantastic about any mm -hmm. of those things. Um, they they're in slightly different periods. You know, Big Boss is kind of. It was supposed to be in the seventies in Thailand. Yeah, Fist of Fury was supposed to be back in the nineteen twenties. Uh, Way of the Dragon was supposed to be in the seventies. Enter the Dragons in the seventies. Game of Death is in the seventies. So he didn't really do, you know, with the exception of Fist of Fury, which is still the twentieth century. He didn't really do like a like an old school costume, like like um costume drama style kung fu movie yeah. like from the Qing Dynasty or anything like that. Right? Mm -hmm. There are photos of him in that garb, but he never actually made any of those movies. Yeah. Um, and that would be the issue with Donnie Yen because, uh, for example, if you look at his char character in Hero, yeah, he's like an ancient, like from the Tong Dynasty swordsman who can like fly and do all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, then how does that guy fight a grounded kung fu killer Donnie Yen? 
You know, when you have like a Donnie Yen character who can like literally fly and cut your head off midair versus one who just has grounded, realistic martial arts. So you, I think when you, if you were to do that thing with Donnie Yen, you would have to say, OK, you would have to do like, OK, five modern Donnie Yen movies and then five kind of Donnie Yen movies where maybe he can fly and shit like that. Right. <laughs> because it, because it, it's, it's not it's not exactly fair you know if you, you like think about michelle yo in crouching tiger hidden dragon yeah of you know, course. she could like uh uh or or Zhang ziyi's character in that movie she could yeah. fly into the bamboo trees and everything like that right mm-hmm. so what would happen if her character from crouching tiger hidden dragon had to fight her character from the grandmaster who's just like some bagua practitioner yeah <laughs> like if the other one can fly over you they're winning right? yes absolutely so, mm-hmm. so yeah i think there would have to be you know with the bruce lee stuff like bruce lee played mostly the same guy right or some variation of the same guy in different films so it would be yeah, a little yeah. easier yeah but yeah, i think donnie yen slays it uh he slays all those other guys Yes, absolutely. I think so too. So many people are confused about basics in Wing Chun Chi Sao. Some view it as a collection of moves and masters confuse their own students by talking of principles and concepts without telling them what's what. The 15 Chi Sao Fundamentals is my attempt at explaining Wing Chun Chi Sao from a perspective of principles, but also with the basic techniques required to express those principles. It shows the framework for Hong Kong Wing Chun Chi Sao, in particular, the training of Pun Sao and Lap Da. This is necessary training before going on to the the higher and more spontaneous expressions of Chi Sao. Right now, if you use the code KFG Chi Sao, you can get a signed copy of my book for the price of the unsigned one. Click on the link in the description below and use the code KFG Chi Sao at checkout to get a signed copy of this full color, over 230 page manual on the vital foundational training exercise of Wing Chun. This offer is good while supplies last, so get yours today. All right, what you got for me? Matthew Boyd. Matthew Boyd. What advice would you give someone who, when it comes to sparring, pad work, and drills, always ends up with the most aggressive person in the class, and you know yourself you can't hone your skills? <laughs> yeah, this is a, a perennial problem in martial arts schools. <laughs> Let me take this one. Don't train with the f***er. No, <laughs> it's funny. Uh, shout out to Matthew Boyd, by the way. He... Uh, he he sent me a photo. He got the fist comes from the sh- heart shirt once and yeah. sent me a really, really cool photo with it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Really super cool, dude. Fantastic. Um, yeah. No, this is a problem because uh, training partner culture within a school is very, very important. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sometimes depending on the type of gym you're training at, I assume that, you know, in a lot of kickboxing gyms, especially gyms that are um, that compete. There's probably a big dog eat dog kind of feeling in some of those gyms. Yeah, it, de- it depends. I mean, I got lucky when I was doing um, when I was training Muay Thai before I got to do this because the gym I went to was run by. Like, I was introduced to it from a friend of mine who's like a, a judo ex world champion, and you know, say so the judo sambo, like the attitude to it. Every, the majority of people there were very welcoming of new people, mm-hmm. right? You know, there was the one or two people that would be kind of dicks yes. and you'd be like, okay, cool, but that's fine. You'll just let, you let them go and hit the heavy bag, kick the heavy bag repeatedly to show how, oh, how they right, 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 right. the problem I found was that once it got into like training, like when it was like, so there was a competition coming up that the comp- competing person, yeah. then anyone that was kind of like kind of lower level got left behind for a bit ah, while I that see, went see. on. Yeah. And my problem was that I was right in limbo because I used to train hard with all the people that trained for competition, but right. I started when I was older. Right. I wasn't so you're not going com- in a competition. Yeah, I wasn't yeah, looking yeah. to compete, but I was looking to be the, the best that I could possibly be. Right. So like I didn't mind sparring with the people and get my ass roundly kicked by them on yes. a regular basis. But then I would get left down with the juniors and I actually got more injured with people that I couldn't train oh, yeah. my skills. Oh yeah. Because I mean, the amount of times I got, kicked in the nuts right by people sure. that just like i'm like yeah we want to do a side kick to the thing and they just yeah kick me straight exactly. in the balls exactly. and it was just like <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah. but um yeah no i mean the the you know, aggressive people just yeah. punch them in the f- no it's yeah, not so good some, ex- it's not so, good some kickboxing gyms they they separate like the competitive and non-competitive classes same mm-hmm. with some jiu-jitsu schools or whatever but it really depends on the atmosphere of the school um, and what is kind of expected in terms of training partner culture and, and the vibe and stuff in a lot of competitive martial arts or even martial arts where competing is part of it, even if not everyone is competing, there is a little bit of that kind of, you know, 
who's who's the top guy kind of thing going on all the time. And some people might just be there because they want to get some exercise or feel more confident or whatever. And then, you know, it's like you, you, you work eight hours and you just want to go and do some drills and do some light sparring and learn something. And then you're you're having to deal with this person this person's ego problems and their personal issues and their inability to like, you know, be a decent training partner. And then they have to like, you know, be the tough guy and hurt other people. And it's like, you know, people are just going for themselves and then they're having to deal with someone else's psychological issues. Right. So, I mean, I don't know what the atmosphere in the gym that he's training at is, but obviously this is something you got to bring up with the coach. Right. Mm -hmm. And I would say if the coach is kind of like, well, you know, toughen up or go fuck yourself or whatever, then maybe that's not the place to train. Right, especially if, if you are sensitive to that kind of stuff. Because well, the right? question is, is it like, is it multiple people, or is it like, as is often the case, maybe just one or yeah, two? Yeah, one or two. There's always you know those. I mean? right? Like everyone else is super cool, right? And then you're gonna do do our, our round robin, and yeah. then you end up with those guys. I mean, you always have some prickish people. Like no matter like how cool your school is or whatever, you have one or two guys there that are just you know a little asocial, a little mean, a little shitty to their training partners, and then it's a matter of you know, reminding during class, like, Hey, this is what's expected of you when you're training with a partner or training with a junior or whatever. If you want to go hard, you go hard with these people or go to this class or whatever. Right. Um, but I remember that he's very early on there was one guy who came to my school. He was a WT practitioner from, I'm going to say Eastern Europe somewhere. And he had the very classic kind of Eastern Europe kind of, mm, I break you kind of mentality. Right. Mm -hmm. But he was a nice guy. Yeah. But anytime you put him up with anybody, like he had already been doing Wing Chun, I want to say for about four years. And then he moved to New York and then he continued to train at my school because at that time I was the representative for Learning Ting Wing Chun. So he was just kind of picking up his training. He only stayed in New York for about six months. So he wasn't like a permanent student and he didn't begin with me, but he would come into the class and like, you know, my more senior students would be totally fine training with him. But then the junior students were afraid of him because he was so aggressive and he didn't train differently with the guy who was here for one week as he would with the person who was here for three years. Yeah. yeah, he, yeah. Just, he just had, just didn't understand that. It's like, yo, this guy just started. Yeah. Maybe you don't need to fully punch him. He'd be so aggressive. So I had an assistant at that time. Uh, his name was Carlos and he was like a former uh, professional football player. And uh, I remember this visitor's name was Laszlo. Laszlo. And, and uh, Carlos, he was like a big, strong dude. And he always liked training with Laszlo because Laszlo was a super aggressive. Mm -hmm. And then so he, he, what he would do with Laszlo before every class is he would go, yo, Laszlo, come here, show me how hard you hit the pads. And he would bring out the kick shield. And he would make Laszlo like chain. And the guy was such a maniac. And the guy would chain punch full power. Not kick it. Blah, blah, blah. He would basically like make him exhaust himself on the kick shield for about five minutes. And Laszlo would be exhausted. And then the class would start and he was way more chill because he would basically just wear this guy out physically. So he would be less of a prick to his partners because he wasn't doing it on purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So it's always like you have to kind of look and see like is the guy trying to be a dick on purpose or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. So that was like how we handled one situation. But that was me, the instructor. Or I should say in that case, it was my assistant looking and seeing how Laszlo was causing some trouble for some of the juniors. And realizing like this can't go on every day because these people who just started they, they're gonna they're gonna get pushed out because mm -hmm. this guy's like you know very jacked and aggro and aggressive in training even though he's like a lovely human being um, so he figured out a way and it worked and he yeah. would do that every single time mm -hmm. uh, and Lazo didn't realize that that's why Carlos would make him exhaust himself on the kick shield <laughs> every time right? so. So we had that. And then another example I had, again, and it was another WT uh, student who came to me from another school. Uh, it's not to say that people who came to me as beginners don't have problems. But I do have to say the students that I've had that had the, the worst attitudes, and I, and I don't say this as a, uh, it's not a personal thing against them. Right. Yeah, it's just that maybe they came from a school that didn't give a shit about training culture, mm -hmm. right? Um, the, 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 you, the, the biggest problem students, and I never really had problem students at City Wing Jump. I had a couple. They came from other WT schools. Yeah, yeah. They, 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 didn't, they weren't like, they didn't start with me. So they didn't learn like some of the classic things you would learn in Learning to Wing Jump. How to control your force, you know, different ways of training with a partner where you can train aggressively but without injuring the shit out of your partner, right? Mm -hmm. Um <clears throat> And so I had this one guy, he had started, I think he'd learned Wing Chun in Europe somewhere. And then he moved to New York and he started training with me. 
and he was um, the smorgasbord of all the most annoying partner traits in one person. Ooh, ooh. And so, so we all know, like, like, it, like this is before me. This is before my time, right? Oh, way before your time. Uh, this person uh, um, is one of. I've only kicked two. Uh, maybe th- no, I've only kicked. I've kicked three people out of City Wing Chun in twenty yeah. something years, which is not bad. It's not bad because be, being in New York, where I had to go like, uh, you got to stop coming. Yeah, um, and this guy was the second one. Um, <clears throat> although it was actually someone more indirect. The way I, I told him not to stop coming, the other two guys. One was a wacky Scientologist who tried to recruit all my students into Scientology, oh my and God. I had at some point I just had to straight kick him out, but not because of the Scientology shit, because of something else. You're like jokes on him. All of my students are already Scientologists. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then the other guy was just someone who was just kind of skeevy and kind of a creep and made yeah. people feel uncomfortable. And I'm like, mm-hmm. nah, you, you can't you be got, here. Yeah. And every year he writes me an email trying to come back to the school. I'm like, no. Oh, he does, does yeah, he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no, wow. No, no. Okay. <laughs> uh, but anyway, this guy here, you know, he had learned some Wing Chun. Maybe he was like a student level four or something before he came into my school. Mm-hmm. And he was the smorgasbord of, of shitty partner. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's a, lots of things that our partners can do. He, he, there's no way to get good at Wing Chun or jujitsu or any martial art where you actually have to have contact with another human being to get good at. Um, there's no martial art where, where you, you don't have to deal with other people and you, and you certainly need other people to get good. You cannot get a good at Wing Chun without a training partner. Yeah. You know, you might be able to get really good at Tai Chi. If you're a Tai Chi guy that doesn't really do push hands without a partner. Mm-hmm. right or archery because <laughs> you're shooting a target right yeah um, but you can't get good at wing chun without partners to help you in cheese out and sparring and fighting and all it just doesn't happen right yeah uh, nobody who's good at wing chun got there by themselves and i'm not just talking about obviously they had their instructor but i mean what about all the people who helped them get those skills you yeah. know i'm sure sifu david peterson can talk about all the people he trained with coming up when he was under wong sun yeah. although you'd mostly hear about like okay he learned from wong sun yeah but he was also training with other people oh, so i'm sure he's got tons of sea hangs and stuff who helped him out yeah that he's very grateful for and also learned a lot from and i'm yeah. also the same way yeah and i think most people would be the same way right oh, absolutely i know i am yeah i mean think about mike tyson learned boxing from customato but i mean you know he also probably got a lot of tips from other people who are coaching him and his other sparring partners yep. and all that kind of stuff. Right. So, I mean, like n- no one is kind of like built by one person. Right. Yeah. So anyway, uh, the, so training partner culture is very, very important. It's very important that Wing Chun instructors, I mean, all martial instructors should do it, but I'm just going to stay in my wheelhouse here. Pay attention to training partner culture, because even if you pay attention to it all the time, there's still going to be issues with students. You can't, it's not, can't ever be perfect, but you, you got to pay attention to it. So uh, a couple of things that training partners can do, and a lot of training partners, let's say bad training partners, might have one of these things, okay? So you have one I call the rep hog. Yeah. The one that hogs all the repetition. So you're doing an exercise, okay, I, you know, a punch defense or a maneuver in cheese out or something, okay? And the one guy does it, like, you know, practices it 10 times, and then when it's your turn to do it, like, you do it twice, and then he's like, okay, now I'm going to go again. So you have the guy who like tries to hog all the reps. Yeah. And when it comes to cheese out stuff, when, when we're drilling, not talking about sparring, that's why you know, a few years ago I said, okay, every drill, one time right, one time left, then your partner, one time right, one time left. Yeah. So you always get an even distribution of reps, both right and left side mm-hmm. and both partners. Yeah. All right. But sometimes with sparring where you're going back and forth or whatever, it's not always clear, but like this guy was a rep hog. All right. He, he would want to get his 10 reps in. And if you got two reps in, he's like, okay, you're good. Now let me keep practicing. So he was a rep hog. Ugh. Um, he was also a, um, uh, a disproportionate, uh, uh, control, uh, partner. So if you lightly tapped him on the jaw with a punch or hit him a little too hard with a palm strike on the chest, Whoa, whoa, whoa. This was always his line. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Take it easy. All right? Go easy. And it would be both when he's the Wing Chun defender. If Mm -hmm. he felt you came a little bit too hard on him, take it easy. We Mm -hmm. are just training. Um, But it would would also be... um, if he was the attacker, being the bad guy, and he felt the Wing Chun, the other guy was coming a little... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Take it easy. We're just training, brother. Oh, yeah, I love but that. But then when it was his turn. Oh, yeah. Okay? Mm-hmm. Um, and I say this without any exaggeration. This guy sent two of my students to the hospital in normal training drills. Wow. 
because, you know, and he'll be going, he was the guy who would kind of go half speed, you know, when it suited him, like, oh, let's go easy. He would go half speed. So you'd go half, like his partner would go half speed with him. And then the very last movement, he would crank something and then go full power. And like, so he was the kind of guy who would go easy and then he would hold onto your neck and do a full face peel, full power and take you to the ground. These were in the old cowboy days of City Wing Chun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Nicole can tell you about those days. City Wing Chun's a much nicer, softer place now. But like in, 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 in those days, it was wild. But he was, and he would, you know, punch people in the throat mm-hmm. and not with controlled force. And I'd yeah. be like, you need to stop that. Oh, oh, but he always had some excuse. He always yeah. had some excuse why he couldn't control his force. But the other or, person. or he would say, no, I didn't hit him hard. No, no. When you hit someone and the other person has a serious reaction, they're the ones that have to tell you how hard that punch was, not you. Yeah. All right. Um, but whenever he would get lightly tapped, he would get so upset. But he had no problem. To, he was the most inconsiderate jerk. Yeah. Um, and then he was also like a kind of, you know, uh, he would say stuff like, hey, stop being a pussy to people in class. Um, and, and sometimes he would say that to someone who had been in the school for two weeks. Yeah. Okay. Someone that is like still getting their feet wet in the class and the school. And he would be, I'd be like, yo, you can't say shit like that to people. Right. Yeah. And he just didn't get it. And the annoying thing about this is like, I would be telling him these things, like the way a dad has to tell a child, like you have to watch a control. You can't practice with people like this, or you can't talk to people like that, or you can't do, you, you have to let the other person practice. And homeboy was like 10 years older than me. Yeah. And this is back when I was in my 30s. I was telling someone who's basically my age now, like stuff that you should learn when you're a kid. Yeah. You know, like golden rule stuff. Right. Yeah. And and uh, yeah, eventually at some point I had to get. Yeah. He, he I always had a soft spot for him. I always gave him like another chance, another chance, another chance. And that was a teachable moment to me. Like there's certain people you can't do that with. Yeah. yeah had I gone yeah. back in time, I would have gotten rid of him right away. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, mm-hmm. So. You're always going to have that guy. And so I think what you do is you tell the instructor like, hey, you know, when we're doing the mitts, like I really want to get some of my own training in and I can't do that with this guy. Or every time I train with this guy, he's trying to injure me. Can you partner me up with someone else? And if the instructor or the trainer or the coach is not receptive to that, then I would leave that gym. But if the instructor or coach is like, hey, okay, no problem. They partner you up with someone else or they say something to that person. Okay, then you're in an okay gym. Yeah. You know, it, like if you if if it's okay to say those kind of things, then I think you're it's all right. It's it's tough though. It it can be a bit tough, it's, especially you know it's been I know it's been tough for some kind of you know lady friends of mine in situations to be able to say stuff like that because yeah. to begin with, you know, there's a, there's an amount of gaslighting to it because you're like when it first starts happening, you're like is this person. Am I actually, am I, am, am I being a bit of a pussy for one right. of am the I best phrase? Am I overreacting, right? right? You know what I mean? Like, and you know, so it can take a second until you start maybe finding out from other people that they have in the same experience, Yes, which yes, yes. becomes a thing. And then you realize that it's not necessarily the gym, but it's like one or two people. Right. But like, you know, these people like they're again, they're like kind of, but then there are times when they're, they might be okay. Yes, you know what I mean? Yes, so yes. you don't want to be like. Hey, like this, this person's like, you know, you, no one really wants to snitch. You know yes. what I mean? And yeah, that's, exactly. that becomes a bit exactly. of an issue. That being said, right. In my experience, there's, was, there's one other, there is one person that kind of like, if he'd been basically, you know, what I'm talking about who'd, who'd, he'd been more skillful would have essentially been the guy that you're telling me about from way back. Yes. Who like, you know, yes. he'd been in better shape and more skillful. He's that guy. Right. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. And there were a couple of people in class that felt that like, because he was too aggressive, uh-huh. like they just, they were just like, you know what? Didn't even get to that point of like to the instructor would come around to the round. Like I'm not training with you. Right. And it was no one said boo to it because it wasn't like some oh, go come back you can try it with him. It's like because everyone knew, right? You know what I mean? Sure, sure, sure. I, even I, who could handle him, yeah. Like because he did all that stuff to me when I was like a gray shirt. Then when I became a technician and we were both technicians, yes, it was like okay, all right. Yeah. So like now we can, yeah. We're, we're now we got enough tools to play with. Yeah, yeah, but like he would still be like still like try and sifu sensei me all the time. Oh yeah, yeah, all Those, the time. Yeah, that's right? the other yeah. type of training partner. So you, you have like the rep hog, you have the guy who can't control himself, and then you have what I call the Sifu Sensei, yeah. who's always trying to correct you, even if they're the same level or sometimes even a lower level, mm-hmm. or they're just not an instructor. It's like I mean, like, you know, as long as we're doing the mechanics of the exercise, mm-hmm. like according to what the instructor said, let the instructor or trainer correct you. Yeah. I don't need your input. 
Yeah, I mean, no. I th- that was a very big teachable moment for me. Is like you get very, I got very zen about it, especially with this particular person, but with anyone who come in because I'm there to train, right? Yes. And I am very much aware of what my personal limitations are. I don't consider myself to be of any kind of like a particularly high standard, but like I know what I can do and I enjoy doing it. So someone who is kind of clearly either on the same level or not as good is telling me stuff that I'm just. Like, I'm not going to get into it. I'm going to go, okay, I just nod and smile. Right. And I just I just let it happen. And it wait. reminds me, you know, I just got an idea. Sorry, I mean, interrupt. Yeah, that's all right. I should create, you know, at the school, like a little sign. Mm-hmm. Like, these are the five archetypes of crappy training partners. Which one are you? That would be awesome. <laughs> that would be awesome. And everyone's really like, hey, that, none of those are me. Yeah, because then, I mean? what, then what we do is we just stigmatize shitty behavior, shitty yes. training partner habits. That would be and awesome. And you know, I can make something nice. Mm-hmm. On the wall, like something that visually looks good and like, Fantastic. you know, yeah, I think, yes. we'll I think do we should that. definitely we'll do, do that. that. Yeah. But yeah, no, I mean, you know, he, um, he did that a lot and like, there were, I gave him receipts at mm-hmm. some point, mm-hmm. you know, um, I also, at least one time when he started fight, trying to fight with me, I just dropped my hands and said, I'm not training with you. Right. And he tried to be like, well, you're going to be like that. I was like, yep. And then like, he was super nice to me like five minutes later. Uh-huh. Right. But it just became this thing where it's like, okay, we all know. And then with some of the younger students who were afraid to kind of maybe come and talk to anyone up, they come to talk to me or like uh, other yeah. people and just be like, right. are we imagining this? And I'm like, no, but if he does this, right. you can come to me and sure, I'll, sure, I'll, sure, sure. I'll have a word. You know right, what I mean? Right. Like, so yeah. there's like a, if you, if you can't go to your constructor, if there's a couple of other people who are in the same people, you yeah. can probably speak to them. Sure. You sure, know what sure, I mean? Sure. That's the yeah. other thing, yeah. you know, so. I feel right. your pain. Yeah. I feel your pain. All right. So I think we have time for a final one. Yeah, we should have one more. Why not? Because, mm-hmm. you know, right. But which, 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 which should we, you know, because someone else has, we have two, but like. Is the, uh, are they quick? Well, I think the first, hmm. I mean, give me one second. Let me just say that. Blah, blah, blah. I can give a quick answer. I'm occasion. I, I, I can be brief on occasion. Okay, cool. Um. All right, you know what, then we can, maybe we can do both. There okay. we go. We'll, we'll keep the other one for later. Who knows, huh? Okay. So the next one, um, Nazari Omar. I hope I pronounced your first name correctly, and if I didn't, I apologize. I have a question. I just joined a Muay Thai and boxing gym for about a month just for health. As a beginner, they spar hard all the time. Hey, we're on a, on a, on a <laughs> thing here, right? Yeah. You know? I didn't realize that they actually, yeah, that's like yeah, two it's similar just, questions. Yeah, that's, and beat the shit out of me. At mm. 49, I don't intend to get brain concussion. What should I do? If I stop, there goes hundreds of my hard-earned money because they only take a lump sum. Get the fuck out of there. Jesus Christ. Yeah. I mean, if, you're, if you're getting hurt and injured... Yeah, it sucks to use that money, but you know what sucks even more? Brain concussion. Exactly. The problem is, this is a is actually fallacious reasoning. It's called the sunk cost fallacy. Yes. People stick with something just because they've already invested something in there, yeah. e- even though it's not giving them what they want or any kind of happiness, mm-hmm. but they keep like watching a, like finishing a TV series that has, you know, like for example, The Walking Dead, once yeah. it started to get awful. And then I know people that were still watching that and it's like, what? Yeah. It's like at some point you go, okay, it was good up until now and I'm going to stop. But there are people like, they're like, no, because I started, I have to finish it. That's sunk cost fallacy. Obviously, it's shitty if you can't get your money back, but um, you're 49. Um, the quality of your brain health is, is going to determine the quality of the rest of your life. Yeah. Because you could lose your ability to move well and your limbs and all that kind of stuff. But the one thing you want to keep straight is your brain. Mm-hmm. And so it doesn't make any sense to be in a place like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, see, I could give a brief answer from yeah, time it was a to brief, time. Brief question, brief answer. Yeah. So what? But yes, it does suck about losing the money, bro. Yeah. You know what I mean? I feel you on that one. So what's the final question? <laughs> I kind of know. Yeah, I'm sorry to well, say. Well, I know who it's from. I don't know what the actual question is because I refuse to read it. Yeah, I'm sorry to say that this man, person, hermaphrodite, I don't know, <laughs> right, has made a reappearance. On Patreon. On Patreon. Yes. After, I, I guess he heard us clowning him all this time. That he was a broke-ass yeah. dude and, and who can't support us on. Because we, we made the joke with Dre that um, we, uh, because we don't want to take questions from this one person anymore. That's one of the reasons why now I only take questions from Patreons. Yeah. And I said, luckily, this person, who we don't want to take questions from, is such a broke-ass, he'll never support us on Patreon. And lo and behold, he is now supporting us on Patreon. And therefore, we are obligated by... Kung Fu Scrolls to answer his question. Yeah. Although it's kind of funny because I think this episode may be a milestone. Is this the first time a question by this individual 
is read by someone other than Dre. It is not. It is not. No, it's not. Oh, well, the first one was... I, I, um, um, the, well, no, the first one was could possibly have been Topher all yes, the way I back. Yes, Topher, But yeah, then yeah. there have since been one where I've read one and Andrew Lynn has went, read one. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, oh, right. it's, it's actually in the, uh, in the height of the supercut that I made. Okay, so Hopefully. let's... Uh... Let's hear it. Okay. So this one's from Dryson. Sorry. Ayo writes that. Anyway, Jesus. Ayo, that's Ayo. a very a very Dre thing. It's not a very Dryson thing. Yeah, no, well. Hmm. Yeah. I have a question for the KFG. By so, the way, I can hear like half of our audience right now just going, fuck. It's been so long since there was a Dryson question. Yeah. Even the editor for Wing Chun Illustrated, Eric Lillior, like a cool friend. He was like, man, like, yeah, like way when we started, he's like, I love your podcast, but I hate Dryson. <laughs> <laughs> because I can imagine like, it's, it's just, it's like, <laughs> it's part, it was partially done as a troll. Mm-hmm. Um, but I can imagine like, yeah, I mean, for, for people who are not totally in tune with like kind of the New York humor of us, it's, it, it can be a bit much. So bear yes. with us. Yeah, please, please. <laughs> because we're bear with it, bearing with it. I tell you, oh my God. Okay. Hey. I have a question for the KFG. So, like, say you are on your way to the 2024... Wait a minute. You need to say it like Dre would say it. Okay. But, All right. But then, you know, but, like, I, that means I have to put an American accent. I don't think I I want to hear your American accent. You know why? Because you give us so much shit when we try to do your accent, which <laughs> I can't tell the difference between mine and yours. They sound exactly the same. And you're saying you sound like Dick Van Dyke. No, I'm just saying when I when I do my English accent, I feel that I sound exactly like you. All right, so let let's let's put the shoe on the other foot. Does that make sense? Do you put the shoe not, on the other foot. I, I was not expecting this at all. By okay, the way, I want to hear at your all. American accent. Okay. Oh my god. Let's go. <laughs> and in particular, so your New York accent because you're doing Dre. Gonna, Dre's got that kind York. of classic New York accent. Yo. Hey, yo, I have a question for the KFG. Whoa, what kind of southern <laughs> bullshit is this? <laughs> it's, I got a question for the KFG. I want to know. That hat, that's real purdy. Is that a MAGA it, is, hat? <laughs> isn't that how, how all of you Americans speak? That's, that's oh, what it I sounds s- like. I <laughs> see what you're doing here, yeah, right? I sure. see what you're doing. Say you are on your way to the 2024 Ultimate Hong Kong Tour, and you are just chilling on the plane, enjoying a movie. <laughs> What the f*** kind of accent is this? <laughs> there's some Texas, there's some Georgia. <laughs> Maybe chatting with your boys, Dre and Mikey, and suddenly you hit some uh, no, kind uh, of turbulence. Uh, uh, Mike, you, normal accent is yeah, fine. See, I told you. Jesus see, Christ. See, no, see, I awful. Have to practice. I have Fucking to practice. awful. I, I never said it would be anything other okay, in my defense. But all I have to say is never give me shit for doing your accent again. <laughs> oh, be- I'm going to give because you Because my version of your accent is better than whatever the f*** that was for Americans. All <laughs> I'm right? pretty sure it's not. But all anyway. Right. All right, let's go. Okay. <laughs> Dear God. <laughs> Dear God. <laughs> all right. Yeah, Scott Atkins is never coming on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, the plane is all bumping and shaking and stuff. And next thing you know, you bump your head and get knocked out. When you come to, you hear the captain. This is a fucking hypothetical, isn't it? It's always a hypothetical. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> All right, okay. <clears throat> when you come to, you hear the captain announcing that the plane is making its final descent into Hong Kong's Kai Tak Airport. Ooh, the old airport. Uh-huh, check you out, right? Dryson getting with the uh, historical references. <laughs> Just like Dryson read a book. <laughs> Unlikely. Yeah. You look around and notice a little... What? A little you sitting a few seats over. <gasps> Baby KFG and his family on their way to their first trip to Hong Kong. Oh, it's the 96 trip. Mm. Mm -hmm. You now have the opportunity to give a younger version of yourself the ultimate Hong Kong tour. Oh, wow. What event do you leave in place? And what ones do you change? Also, do you tell him about the Eamon Bosch Deppie versus William Chung fight? (laughs) Man, such a dick. What a troll, what a troll. Such a dick. Okay, well, first of all, the 1996 version of me, Mm -hmm. although I had not yet started WT, knew about the William Chung and Eamon (laughs) fight. Because anyone who did Wing Chun knew about that. Also, I think 1996 was still only 10 years after that fight happened. So it was still... Now it's really ancient history, but back then it was still it was still shit that people talked about, right? Yeah. Um, although I didn't really, I had not met Sifu Amy, and so I, I didn't, I wouldn't, I wasn't an insider by any stretch of the imagination. Although on that particular story, although I've heard a lot of things mm-hmm. from people 
who were around at that time, I still wouldn't consider myself the ultimate insider in what happened between behind the scenes between Amy and William Chow. But um, <clears throat> I, I know more than most. I'll put it that way. Yeah. Um, I suppose he wonders, would I go back in and, and, and warn the 18 year old KFG, baby KFG uh, not to go into that massage parlor? Or would I uh, tell him not just to walk into Jackie Chan's office asking to meet Jackie Chan or all the <laughs> dumb shit that I did on that first trip to Hong Kong? Um, no, that would be amazing. I mean, I, I said that this is actually the least annoying hypothetical he's ever done. Um, because what I said when I started the ultimate Hong Kong Kung Fu tour is I'm like, this is what I wish I had the first time I came to Hong Kong. Yeah. I came to Hong Kong in 1996, no internet, no smartphones. You know, I had Bay Logan's Hong Kong action cinema book, uh, John Little's uh, the warrior within two books that are still on the shelf to this day. Um, and, and a map, an actual paper map of Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And the only way that I found out where shit was in Hong Kong was if, if there was an address in a magazine for something and I had written it down. Um, and then even there you have to look on the map and figure out where that might be. Um, and the other thing was the Hong Kong phone book in my hotel in Sha Tin. I just opened the phone book into the yellow pages of the Hong Kong phone back in the day when phone books still existed. And looked up martial arts and found like the, some kung fu soups, found some kung fu schools and found the martial arts supply stores. So that's actually how I just walked in there and found that stuff out. Now, had I known, had I had this version of the KFG, meaning me helping out that 18 year old version of me, oh man, that would be amazing because I could have shown him so much stuff and I would have been able to do stuff with the younger version of me that no longer exists in Hong Kong. Yeah. Like visit Kwan Ta King's apothecary and, 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 uh, um, you know, go to some spots that were in films that are no longer there now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and visit people who are no longer with us, mm -hmm. uh, including some of Yip Man's students and stuff. Um, you know, in 19, I, I would have had the chance to meet Wong Sun Leung. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And this version of KFG would have been like, you're in Hong Kong right now. You need to go, we need to go meet Wong Sun Leung. Right. Um, or uh, Chai Sung Teen or a number of Yip Man students who were still around back then who are not around anymore. Um, yeah, that would have been amazing. And yeah. what would have been interesting is I, I can't imagine the stories and things I would have learned had I gone back and been able to take advantage of the things that you no longer can do in Hong Kong back then. And had I told that version of me mm -hmm. and given that version of me the tour of Hong Kong, so that version of me would know where everything was after the first trip. Yeah then how much would that version of me know now after 27 trips to Hong Kong? Yeah. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. I only, you know, having gone so many times, I can now, because I learned a little bit on this trip, this trip, I went here, this trip, I went there. I could have dumped, I could have, as, as Sifu Leung Ting would say, download all the shits into that version of me. Mm -hmm. And that version of me would have been so much more ahead and would have been able to do so much more. Yeah, the only problem is, is that that might have ended up being the last Hong Kong Ultimate Tour. We may not ever had it because, you know, if you've gone back and changed history, then, you know, two years later, 9-11 no. wouldn't, you know, five, five years later, 9-11 wouldn't have happened. And then three <laughs> years later, then, you know, the world ends in some kind of nuclear holocaust. Yeah, you're right, you're right. I would have tried to prevent all those things, right? Because you fucked it up, basically. Yes, exactly. You, know I mean? exactly. Like, you might have prevented it and then just made it worse. I think we wouldn't be here. It's possible. Yeah. Yeah, it could have been nothing but chaos. Absolutely. We could be living in like the Terminator, you know, uh, Skynet kind of mm -hmm. thing. So maybe it's a good idea that I never did go back in time. Absolutely. And that's all I got to say about that. All right, everyone. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Kung Fu Genius. As always, don't forget to subscribe to the Kung Fu Genius. Hit that bell for notifications. Don't forget to support us on Patreon. And if you have any questions for a future episode, you better be on Patreon. Otherwise, comment below. And I'll see you guys next time. Word is I'm a kung fu genius Technique speaks for me, not lineage Forget Jet Li, cause I'm the one Many call me Sifu, but to you I'm Seagung And I produce masters, you surpassed us Your kung fu stiffer than corpse and caskets City Wing Chung is the house I built Violate the gate and your blood gets spilt Alex Richter, always the victor Hey, these are the, gonna be the coolest outtakes you've ever had to deal with, Andrew Best things ever Okay, you ready? that shit get out of my mind uh, yeah so when it comes to chinese martial arts and this is hold on a second okay <laughs>
Andrew may or may not want to edit that out. So I have a uh, I have a digital photo album yes, here. Yes, absolutely. And it's like just mostly photos of my kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's like a couple of videos. And that video plays like every hour and a half. Right? Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so when you're here uh, for any time, you're going to hear that. Right? It's very funny. So um, <laughs> welcome to the KFG layer, right? Mm-hmm. Everyone's like, oh, it's just kung- it's mostly kung fu books, weapons, food, and like kid stuff. <laughs> like That's basically my house. Then you're going to have someone come in and say, oh, it's because you don't understand about alignment and f***ing and all this kind of stuff, right? And then the moment you start talking about f***ing and alignment, someone's going to say, why can't you just explain it with normal body mechanics, right?